hopelessness is something not very pleasant to think about, yet inevitably it comes up and it seems inevitable often in our life. Maybe it's a personal tragedy that you've experienced. Other times it may be just a state of being of how things are, whether it's brokenness that's around us in our culture, in our nation, when we see broken homes, broken neighborhoods around our community, terrible epidemics, uh, tragedies uh, that occur each and every day around our globe. And there seems to be no easy solution to it. Pastor Timothy talked about the starfish example of how, you know, how are we going to save all these starfish? It seems like their situation is inevitably and hopeless. For many of us, a day of tragedy that we can all remember is what Jason Osborne mentioned earlier about 9-11. That was a day that, that shook our nation. It was a day of great loss, of great tragedy, of needless death um, that forever changed us as a nation. And when we think about days like that, I want today for you to learn of another day, um, uh, kind of like a Jewish 9-11, a, a Jewish holiday of great mourning and sadness commemorating a day um, called Tisha B'Av. And Tisha B'Av is the ninth of Av, uh, the fifth day, uh, the ninth day of the fifth month of the Jewish calendar, usually in the summertime. And it's a day that was uh, commemorated back in the Old Testament days, as it is uh, still honored and observed today by modern Jews. And what it is, is it's arguably the most tragic single day ever recorded in the entire Old Testament. The day that Babylon overtook Jerusalem, destroyed the city, and destroyed the Holy Temple of the Lord. And um, when we, you might flip through your Bible, and as you're flipping through, you might come across uh, the prophet Joel or the prophet Zephaniah. And uh, you might be reading it and just be like, wow, these are, these are some Debbie Downers here. Why, what is this day about, uh, this day of destruction and judgment? Uh, well, that's the day. That is the historical day, the ninth of all that occurred. And so throughout the Old Testament, you'll hear about these terrible, awful things, um, warning the Israelites to know, do not go astray uh, from the God of Yahweh, or else there's going to be these dire consequences. And unfortunately, uh, they did not heed their warning. Uh, the Book of Lamentations give us the most vivid um, and graphic images of that day. Many believe the book was written by the prophet Jeremiah because he was uh, indeed an eyewitness of that day. Uh, you can read all about it in uh, Jeremiah chapter 39, uh, recounts what Jeremiah saw that day. Um, and Lamentations is just a, in a song form, poetically just describing uh, just vivid imagery of what happened uh, on the streets and all around uh, Jeremiah that day. And one thing to keep in mind is during ancient warfare, the outside army had the disadvantage if they were to go in and storm because the interior kingdom had fortifications, they had ramparts, um, but the outside invading army had time on their side. So what Nebuchadnezzar did uh, that day in uh, 586 BC was he went and encircled, or well, two years before that, so 84, I guess it would be, uh, he would encircle the walls of Jerusalem. So there's a Jerusalem wall and then an out, another wall outside of siege um, barricades all around the city. And what that would do would cut off access to the fields. It would cut off access to the water supplies. It would cut off access to the roads where messengers and couriers could not longer um, get help from allies or the outside world, uh, what they would do is completely cut them off, um, disable and uh, inebriate the city of Jerusalem. And then on that fateful day, when the walls finally breached, they would go in and find very little resistance uh, due to the famine and the starvation and the weakening of the troops there. So Lamentations chapter four really goes over uh, just how terrible that day was. And I just want you to listen to what Jeremiah describes on that day. Uh, starting in verse eight, uh, Jeremiah says, now their faces were blacker than suit, um, referring to the smoke. 
that was all over them. They were not recognized in the streets. Their skin has been shriveled on their bones because of their skinniness. It has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger, who wasted away, pierced by the lack of fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women have boiled their very own children. They became food for them during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent of his wrath. He poured out his hot anger, and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. Wow, how horrific that day was to be a witness there. So that day just had unimaginable destruction. The Israelites living during that time quite literally thought that the end of the world had came. They were comfortable, always thinking that the one true God, Yahweh, would always be there to protect them, always be there to protect his holy temple. But that day, they were sorely disappointed. The promised land given to Abraham was completely obliterated, desolate, nothing but char and rubble. God's holy temple, the place of the abode of his holy presence, is kavod. The most sacred location on the face of the earth, completely destroyed, looted for its valuables, left to rot. The king of Judah, of Davidic lineage that was promised to be eternal, Zedekiah, uh, saw his own sons be killed and was blinded afterwards, uh, was put into prison in Babylon where he would later die. Um... So think about it. The nation, the kingdom of the one true God was completely gone in a twinkling of an eye. Everything was gone. No more land, no more king, no more high priest, no more temple to worship God. Everything was gone. Everything was hopeless. But we get a letter within this hopelessness from Jeremiah in, chapter, in Jeremiah chapter 29. He promises that in 70 years, God is going to turn things around and he's going to bring back the people and, and have them go and rebuild completely what was destroyed. And if you were 70 years old hearing this message, boy, you weren't very encouraged, were you? I mean, 70 years, God? I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to see you before, you know, 70 years is over. So that truth really settled in. And Jeremiah taught something that was counterintuitive. He told the exiles in Babylon, you know what, kick back, enjoy, you know, lay back, uh, build houses, marry, you know, go and settle in, uh, you maybe even join a, a school board in, of Babylon. So you're going to be part of that community. And he said, do not worry that everything is going to be okay because God has plans for you to prosper there not for wickedness, a hope and a future in Babylon. And um, you might hear Jeremiah 29, 11 on every graduation card, but originally this was a context of that verse, that famous verse, uh, to give the uh, exiles with hopelessness a hope and a future, even if it wasn't going to be immediate. And he also goes on in that letter, and later in chapter 29, he gives... Uh, a warning to be wary of false prophets. Prophets that tell falsehoods that we hear even to this very day. Telling them that, oh, there's hope. All you have to do is believe and God is going to be there right around the corner. You know, there's going to be miraculous where the chains break and, you know, they're swished back into Jerusalem and everything's going to be just the way it was uh, almost overnight. Jeremiah warned against that, uh, condemning these false prophets, giving false hope. And even today, we hear that same false hope echoed in many things like the prosperity gospel, saying that uh, if you believe it, you'll receive it, that you won't have to go through pain, you won't have to go through suffering, that if you just believe hard enough, all your material needs and comforts will be taken care of in a twinkle of an eye. But we know from Scripture, um, patterns again and again through Scripture, that that's not how God works. God is faithful to his promises, but rarely do they happen overnight in such a, 
instant fashion. And so we're fast forwarding, 70 years have passed, so a whole lifetime of forgetting the Torah, forgetting the Hebrew language that they grew up in has passed. And just as Jeremiah said, you know, starting in the, the book of Ezra, uh, that the Lord has promised and he was good on his promise. So that terrible, awful kingdom of Babylon was overthrown. A new empire took its place. Um, King Cyrus of Persia took power and he was generous enough to go and liberate the Jews and tell them that they can return and rebuild in their homeland. So that is a cause for celebration, but it's also important to keep in mind that this was not an easy decision. That for the last 70 years, they've, you know, they built homes, they settled into new lives. Uh, they were kind of over the whole Jerusalem thing. It was forgotten probably or by this time. And so think about what you're asking to do. You're asking for people who've grown up, you know, only knowing the comforts of Babylon, telling them to walk 100 miles, pitch tents, and live for years and years rebuilding nothing but rubble. And so imagine that. Um, you might know the, uh, many of the, the exiles moved to the capital of Persia, which was Susa. And if Susa sounds familiar to you, it is the city where the Book of Esther takes place. And the Book of Esther really illustrates how assimilated and um, meshed in Jewish culture and Persian culture was during that time. Uh, you know, they, Jews were elevated like uh, Queen Esther, right? They were still uh, just as part of the culture there. So they had no reason to leave. And on top of that, Susa was the most beautiful, secure city in the ancient world at that time. Why would you ever want to leave? Why would you ever want to get out of your comfort zone? Well, 50,000 of the Hebrews decided to go and take a risk and go rebuild their homeland. And why did they do that? Why did they have that boldness? Because they believed in the hope and the promise of the one true God, Yahweh. So they go, they enter into the land after many, many uh, months traveling all the way from the Euphrates, and they arrive in the rubble of Jerusalem, the place that wasn't familiar to anyone but maybe a granddad. And so the first thing that they did is they went to the site of the temple and they built an offer, and they offered sacrifice after sacrifice. They celebrated booths which was an appropriate festival because they were intense. They had to be intense anyways, uh, just like they were in the wilderness. And each day, uh, work and gather material. And so you would think, okay, now they're going to lay the foundations, they're ready to go, they've made this long journey. Uh, but no, reality settles in. So what happens is, well, they have to get a floor plan, they have to get the supplies, they have to hire uh, Phoenicians from up north to go and, and help get workmen and craftsmen to... Uh, know what they're doing. And so this is a long process. This is another two years, two years and two months of just being in this wilderness, preparing and making logistical uh, adjustments. Uh, but finally, here we go. Okay, they've got it. And after two years and two months, they finally lay down the foundation. One um, often misconception of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is a lot of people think that, okay, you know, Ezra came first to rebuild the temple, and then Nehemiah came in later to build the walls. Uh, when the reality is that Ezra and Nehemiah are both in the second generation, so they weren't part of the original 50,000 that first came there. Um, and that's who we're going to really focus on today, is a lesser-known, unsung hero of the Old Testament. Uh, the first governor of Judah uh, under King Cyrus, and his name was um, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel. And he was an important figure because he was the last heir of the Davidic lineage. He was um, the grandson of Jehoiakim who survived the exile, uh, one of the king's sons who survived exile. So he is um, really fit to restore what was lost. And uh, he has a high priest also with him named Yeshua. And so they go and they lead this first um, journey back into the promised land and they're there working uh, two and a half year, two years two months past they lay the foundations down and you're thinking okay hope is on the horizon god everything's going to work out but nope 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 things uh there's a snatch in god's plan seemingly so they go 
And they're hindered by the Samaritans. The Samaritans, you've heard of them in the Old Testament, uh, who Jesus encounter. So the Samaritans were the northern part of Israel who was taken over by Assyria. And they were intermixed with different um, gods of the Assyrians. And so they were not faithful to just Yahweh. But nevertheless, they wanted to, okay, you know, they have the temple for this God. They have a temple for that God. Oh, let me help you with the temple of Yahweh. But Zerubbabel and the elders like, no way, no, like we are here dedicated to Yahweh alone. And Cyrus has given us an edict specifically for us to build this. And so the Samaritans are very uh, salty by this or angered. And what do they do? They go behind their back and they write a letter to a new king that has uh, arisen in Persia named Artaxerxes. So they write to Artaxerxes saying, hey, you know, these uh, Israelites are no good. Uh, they're doing terrible things. Uh, they're King Zedekiah, you know, back when Nebuchadnezzar, they, you know, they betrayed Nebuchadnezzar. They joined the Egyptians and, and tried to rebel against them. And they're going to do the exact same thing if you give them the chance to rebuild and fortify. Once again, they're going to betray betray the Persians, which of course wasn't true. But nevertheless, it worked. So they, the Artaxerxes gets this letter and now he's concerned. He's like, okay, we got to cut this out. We're going to go and stop uh, these Israelites from rebuilding. So these weary Israelites um, are stopped. Uh, Xerxes sends men to uh, cease the production of what they were doing. And a report found in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 actually suggests that the king's men destroyed everything that they had built up to that point. So imagine all this work, years and years of work, and everything just erased, just like that. Like, where is God in that moment? Everything was coming together until it didn't. And so uh, hope was extinguished. You know, it seemed like they came there all for naught. All was just a waste of time, so it seemed. Uh, but God rose up two uh, very important prophets that you can read in your Old Testament. They're the prophets uh, Zechariah and Haggai. And Zechariah and Haggai go and encourage the Israelites to say, you know what? Don't listen to these authorities. Go and keep building. God is going to be with you. Go and keep building. And so Zerubbabel and the Israelites are encouraged. They're like, okay, we're going to keep building. We didn't come here for nothing. We're going to keep doing it. And the risk with that is that, of course, they can, the authorities can just come back and just kick down their sandcastle, right? They can come back and kick down everything and undo all that they did. But nevertheless, they go and they keep building. So they go and time goes by. And sooner than later, the Samaritans come back and rat them out. They say, oh my goodness, you know. They go to another new king, a new king named Darius, and say, hey, you know, they're up to no good. They're going back and rebuilding. And we need to stop them before they rebel. And so... Here's what it's like, oh my gosh, like how can I, no, this is not what we want to do. Uh, please um, don't listen to these people. And they, what they do is appeal um, and say, hey, go back to the original uh, edict that Cyrus did uh, in the royal archives and go and find that letter. And that will prove our case that God is doing something with us here, that, that we are in our right to be doing what we're doing. And so uh, King Darius goes, and by God's grace, they find this edict lost years and years ago since the first edict. And Darius makes probably the most encouraging thing that the Jews could have imagined. And um, I want you to stand and hear it, uh, because his response is going to be our verse for today. So please uh, stand, if you are able to, and turn to Ezra chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, and let us hear together what King Darius has to say in response. Uh, starting in verse 12, or uh, in verse 7, sorry. Uh, Leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, I decree concerning you uh, that you are to do to these elders of Judah and rebuilding the house of this God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river, and that is without delay. Whatever is needed, both young bulls, rams, and lambs for a burnt offering to the God of heaven and the wheat, the salt, uh, wine, and anointing oil, as the priests in Jerusalem request, it is to be given to them daily without fail." that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons, referring to King Darius. And I issued a decree that any man who violates this edict, a timber shall be drawn from his house and he shall be impaled on it. 
and his house shall be made a refuge of heap on account of this. May God, who caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who attempt to change it, so as to destroy the house of God in Israel and Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued this decree. Let it be carried out with all diligence. You may be seated. So, wow. Like, how amazing. So not only does this king respond by tolerating, simply letting them build it, he is completely on the side of the returnees. And things have, the situation has turned to its head. So now they have the full support of the Persian government of not only are they allowed to build, they're going to get resources, they're going to get all their needs met, and anyone who interferes with them, man, they're going to, they're going to be executed. So Darius is very, very serious about this, and God is just using in his providence uh, a, an ability to protect these um, Israelites who had faith, who had hope to keep pouring and kept believing, even though their circumstances told him there was no hope, even though they were set back time and time again, God still gave them hope again and again if they just held on a little bit longer, if they just kept and hoping in the Lord. So hope didn't manifest itself overnight. It wasn't a cheap, false hope that everything was going to be okay at the snap of a finger. It was a long, drawn-out hope, having faith, never being shaken that God's promise was going to come to fulfillment. There was never doubt, no matter the circumstances, that God was going to do his will. And the Israelites, who were brave enough to believe, persevered through all that turmoil, all those challenges. And it reminds us of just like the temple was revived and rebuilt, it reminds me of revival here at Wynn Stanley Baptist Church. Not long ago, we had a consequential vote. Um, and I believe no matter how you voted that day, uh, what that vote didn't affirm was uh, complacency. It didn't confirm complacency. And as we think about how we can be on fire to reach out to those outside of our church, how we can uh, come back and, and um, revive as a thriving uh, body of Christ, going out down our hill, uh, speaking Jesus, speaking truth to those in need, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our family. Um, we need to have that fire, just as the returnees of the exile had the fire that wouldn't go out. We need to do the same at the church here. When we think about uh, a time right around the first town hall meeting that we had, uh, when we were discussing things, there was just so much animation and excitement and a fire about going and, and reaching out and evangelizing and doing all these amazing things. And it wasn't long afterwards that we had our first service and outreach Sunday evening event uh, with our three and Timothy and I were talking and we were thinking, oh, you know, we're, we might have 10, 15 people. We'll order two pizzas and be good. Uh, we ended up having about 40 and uh, we needed more than two pizzas. So God just provided just a surge, just on fire uh, for, for opportunities to go and serve. Uh, but let me be blunt, lately that fire has waned. It has come in and out. Uh, but it is important for us to keep it alive, that we need to keep a fire going and still have hope, still hold on, not letting circumstances determine us, but letting God's truth, God's hope pour into our life and keep going and keep believing. So that is how we're going to build resiliency. So right after the service, um, I, Christine, uh, Debbie, some others, we're going to go out to the lobby and sign up, you know, we're not going to have a formal meeting or anything, just people who are interested in helping out with outreach. Now, it would be a problem if every single person here in this congregation just completely squeezed into the lobby. Um, yeah, it would be really crowded. And, uh, but at the same time, you know what, that is a problem I can live with. If everyone did that, that is a problem. You know, there might be some logistical issues, but I'm going to get over it because that would be so amazing uh, to see so many people able and excited to do anything to help serve. And you know what? Maybe you can't join the committee. Maybe you have other obligations and you can't come to every single meeting. Uh, but what you can do is come uh, to me, to Christine, uh, to somebody and say, hey, you know what? 
Um, I can make a meal. I can write a letter. I can hand out a flyer. I can provide somebody a ride. Uh, here's my number. Call me if you need me. You know, because I'm all in. I'm all in uh, being part of the growth of Win Stanley. So as we think about that, of an opportunity of how can we serve, how can we use our gifts, even the little ones, um, to join in the efforts of our church body. And more than just our church body, think about someone in your life. I know there's someone in your life, in every person in this room, uh, that they love, whether it be a nephew, a granddaughter, maybe a neighbor, a best friend, a coworker that you always see, that you always look forward to seeing. But deep down, you know uh, that their relationship with Christ is just not where it needs to be. Maybe they've fallen away. Uh, maybe they just weren't interested and, you know, hate when you bring up church or Christ or anything. Um, but don't give up. Don't give up hope. I want you just to think of just one person, one person in your life that you can be thinking about that, God, I can be praying for, that, uh, that maybe after the service I can just text and be like, you know what, I know I've told you about going to church a million times, but I just want to let you know I'm praying for you, that I love you, that I care for you, and I'm here if you need anything. And once you do that for one person, you're going to be able to do that for many other people if you take that bold first step. So I encourage you, as we close out this service, to think about, Lord, how can I believe in not false hope that things are going to change overnight, but God, in your reality, in your real hope, that even when hindrance comes, even when barricades come against us, that God, you are going to be for us, that you are going to, um, your, your truth is still going to be there, and we need to act like we still believe in that. I want to end on another verse in Lamentation. So I started this sermon talking about how dire things were, what Jeremiah saw on the streets in Lamentations. But I want to point you to another verse in that same book. It's Lamentations uh, chapter 3, verses 22 through 26. And it defines what real hope looks like. It reads, The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassion does not fail. They are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who await him. To the person who seeks him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. So as we wait, it is not a, a passive wait, but going on, carrying on, knowing that ultimate hope is here. It might not be around the corner. It might not be around the bend. It might not be a, a magic bullet um, where hope can be in your life or in the life of our nation or in our church or anywhere. But God has ultimate hope for all of us. And we need to go through our everyday life believing in that hope, acting like that hope is about to be fulfilled. We can't be discouraged. We can't let that fire out. So I pray as we go out and we talk to our friends who've you know, we know that, oh my gosh, you know, God, they're never gonna, they're never gonna accept Christ. They're never gonna, don't say that. Don't give up hope. There is breath in their lungs. There's opportunities for the grace of Jesus to enter into their lives. So do not give up hope. We're going to end with uh, a hymn, In Christ Alone, Our Hope is Found. And as we sing that together, I want you to just think about that, of the hope only found in Christ. And the altar will be open so those who maybe not have been where they need to in their relationship with Christ, uh, maybe they've, they've fallen away from their faith, they know someone who has fallen away from their, fight, their faith, and they just need prayer. Uh, they just need hope right now. So please join me in the altar if you need prayer. Um, but other than that, please join us as we now stand and sing together in Christ alone.